Welcome to Biscuits and Jam from Southern Living. I'm Sid Evans, Editor-in-Chief of Southern Living Magazine. And this week I'm talking with someone I've known pretty much since she was born. Nora Brown is a young banjo-playing prodigy who's devoted her talent and her voice to performing old-time music. Though she grew up in Brooklyn, where we first met, her father is from Nashville, Tennessee, and she spent a lot of time with musicians in that state and in eastern Kentucky learning her craft. Her most recent album, Long Time to Be Gone, was called A Disarming Collection of Traditional Laments and Exquisite Banjo Instrumentals by The New Yorker. And now she's getting ready to play out on the West Coast, as well as in Europe and Canada. We'll talk about all that and a few old-time music legends on this week's Biscuits and Jam. Nora Brown, welcome to Biscuits and Jam. Thanks for having me, Sid. I'm excited to be here. So, Nora, I just want to say in full transparency that I've known you pretty much since you were born. Mm -hmm. I'm a huge fan of your parents, so I don't have a lot of journalistic credibility here. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's good to be up front with that. Yeah. I think the last time I saw you, we were actually on Polly's Island in South Carolina sometime before the pandemic. Does that place have a lot of meaning for you and your family? Yeah, it does. I'm not quite sure where it stems from, but I've been going there my whole life. I know my family has been going there since before I was born, but yeah, it's a really special place. It's interesting because I don't really have any like very solid connections to it. It's not like I have family who live down there or there's a real tie that's very apparent, but I have so many great memories associated with that beach and that river and fishing down there. Yeah. Well, I know you guys go every year and we love it too. Big part of our lives as well. So Nora, you live in Brooklyn and that's where you've grown up, but your dad is from Nashville. How often do you get back to Tennessee? Well, we try to go down there maybe a little more often than every holiday, but usually there for Christmas and Easter, and sometimes a little in between. Obviously, there's a a lot of music in that town, so sometimes it works out that if I have a show or something else happening, it can be great because I can see family and do something like that. I have a feeling you're going to be spending probably a lot more time in Nashville in the coming years. It just has a certain gravitational pull to it, particularly when you're a musician. Yeah, it seems like it. Lots of people are moving down there right now. Yeah. Even from Brooklyn, from New York City, lots of musicians. So do you have a lot of extended family in Tennessee? I mean, are there a lot of aunts and uncles, cousins, that kind of thing? Yeah, 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 for sure. I actually think that family roots go pretty far back in Nashville, the town itself, at least a few generations, but longer in Tennessee and Kentucky in that general area. But yeah, I know that my grandparents and my great grandparents, they live across the street from each other. My dad grew up across the street from his grandparents. And my aunt and uncle live down the street from my grandparents currently. Yeah, it's close knit, it seems. Goes back a long way. Yeah, yeah, it does. So Nora, I always talk about food a little bit on this podcast. And I'm wondering what you've grown up with when it comes to Southern food, I mean, is that something that your folks make at home or do you have to head south? I think I usually have to head south, but (laughs) on special occasions, I think we'll pull out the occasional marshmallow sweet potato casserole (laughs) up here. It's something I definitely enjoy. I know that whenever we arrive at my grandparents' house from the airport, this isn't necessarily Southern I guess it is a little, I mean, it it is because that's where I'm eating it, but there's always some chicken and broccoli and some great rolls. You know, that's pretty Southern there. Yeah. A nice little circular thing of the connected rolls that you can pull apart. I always really enjoy that. I definitely don't get that in Brooklyn. No rolls. Yeah. Those like Sister Schubert rolls probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) That sounds right. Yeah. Who's the best cook in your family? And feel free to include grandparents in that question. My grandpa's definitely the best at breakfast. 
<laughs> he's got a lot of different moves that he can do in the morning. Sometimes crepes. That's pretty fun. Wow. And biscuits, bacon, always bacon. Bacon's such a special thing to me for some reason. I feel like I don't have it a lot in my day-to-day life. I guess, I mean, it's a weekend thing. Yeah. I know that that smell of the bacon cooking in my grandparents' house, it's so vivid. Do y'all go down there for the holidays? Like, what's on the table when you go down there for a holiday? Easter, it's usually more of a breakfast kind of brunch hour that we're eating. So there's definitely deviled eggs out there. There's fruit salad that has frozen white stuff, and then there's chunks of fruit in it. (laughs) I don't know exactly what it is. It's pretty good, though. (laughs) There's always quiche, which my family usually makes the quiche, my mom or my dad. Now I'm thinking about more like Thanksgiving, Christmas stuff. I think a lot about that sweet potato, marshmallow, casserole there. That's a staple, huh? Yeah, it's a staple. (laughs) I always go for that. (laughs) So, Nora, let's talk about music. I came across a video of you on my phone when you were six or seven years old, and you were playing a banjo and singing an old folk song. And I saved it for all these years because I thought it was sort of remarkable. I mean, even then, it was really something to hear you singing at that age. Who first taught you to play? Yeah, I was actually watching that video this morning. My dad was showing it to me. I was trying to decipher what song I was singing. I really couldn't tell. I think I was a little shy. I was singing kind of quietly. But I started learning probably around that time that video was taken. I think maybe I was seven or eight in that video. I started playing old time music when I was around six and I was on the ukulele and it was all kind of by chance. It was kind of random. A friend of a friend recommended this teacher. His name was Shlomo Pesco and he was the historian and musician, of course, and he was around in New York City during the folk revival. So that was like traditional music and old time music consumed his life. He dedicated a lot of his time to researching the history of the banjo and just different aspects of traditional music. And you can read some of his work in the book Banjo Roots and Branches, which came out a couple years ago. There's a couple different contributors that uh, have done research on the West African roots of the banjo and tracing things to exact instruments and lots of interesting stuff. So in these early lessons, I would kind of learn old time tunes and songs, but no melody, really. I would just be playing the chords on the ukulele. I often have a hard time when people ask why I decided to play the ukulele or a lot of choices behind that point in my life. I can't really say what drew me to the music when I was so young. It's hard to remember the reason for your choices at that age, but I also think that those folk songs that I was learning, they're very similar to just children's songs that we're singing in school and stuff around that age. So it wasn't unusual for me to be singing those tunes. And eventually I progressed into learning different instruments and stuff that was deeper into the tradition and learning the banjo when I was a little older. But anyways, that was my introduction to it. And I like to think of it as kind of like a slow incline. Like there's not a lot of like, whoa, that's so weird. And I really didn't think it was unusual when I was learning back then. You know, there are so many stories in these songs. There's a tradition of storytelling that's associated with old time music. And a lot of the stories are sad. It's about tough times and depression era songs. There are songs about mules and (laughs) coal mining and whiskey and all sorts of stuff. But when did you become aware of the stories behind these songs? And I'm wondering if there was one that sort of stood out to you that really resonated with you. Yeah, well, I can even take this back to what I was talking about a little bit before. When I was learning from Shlomo, he would teach me these old songs, and he would often alter the lyrics so they would be child-appropriate for me. So, (laughs) for example, there's a song called Police Come. And it goes, police come, didn't want to go this morning. Police come, didn't want to go this evening. Police come, didn't want to go. Shot him in the head with a 44 this morning. Those are the original lyrics. And I think he changed it to something like, police come, didn't want to go. Then we shared an ice cream cone this morning. So he protected <laughs> me a little bit from some of the content of those songs. But yeah, what you're talking about is very important. A lot of these songs old stories that tell about a a very difficult way of life and struggle that I could never know or understand. There's this song called Wild Bill Jones that I feel like 
I associate it with when I started becoming a little more independent about what I was learning. And I kind of stopped taking lessons maybe around the time I learned that song. I was taking banjo lessons at that time from someone named Eli Hetko. And he's a local musician in Brooklyn and great banjo player. In that lesson, when I learned the song, I had picked it out from this record called On the Tennessee Line, a Virgil Anderson record. And Virgil was from the Kentucky, Tennessee borderline, closer to East Kentucky. He's probably my favorite banjo player to date and has this really cool bluesy style of playing. He was super influenced by a lot of blues musicians in his area. There's these guys, Cooj and Cooney Bertram, who all played a lot of blues and, and some old time. And so I think that you can really hear the blues influence in his banjo playing. It's very unique. He has kind of crazy picking styles and his singing has this slow lilt to it. There's not a lot of melody in it. He kind of just says the words. Anyways, I picked that song out on that record and I was in this lesson with Eli and we were working through the song off the record and he was helping me translate it. It's a murder ballad and it tells the story of a guy whose significant other is cheating on him and he shoots the guy. That's kind of the story. Pretty common story. <laughs> it's pretty common along the murder ballad lines. But yeah, I just I remember really listening to the verses and learning that song in that kind of period where I was starting to like develop a sense of my own control around what I was playing and what I was learning. And it's a great song. I don't know how much I love the story, right, but right. I do love that the story is being told and that it's been passed down through many hands over time. You know, yeah. that's important. After the break, I'll talk more with Nora Brown about how she got into playing old time music, some of her own recordings and some of her trips to Eastern Kentucky. Welcome back to Biscuits and Jam from Southern Living. I'm Sid Evans, and today I'm talking with banjo prodigy Nora Brown, who plays old-time traditional music. So, Nora, as you got older, you started to take some trips to Kentucky, and it became more than just learning the songs. You were really learning about the culture and learning about some very specific places. I'm wondering what some of those places were that you've visited I think probably the first time that I went down was probably for this camp called Cowan Creek Mountain Music School. And that's in Letcher County, Kentucky. It's outside of Whitesburg. This is Eastern Kentucky. Yeah, this is Eastern Kentucky. And this is a camp that made a point of having local teachers teach traditional music that was from that region specifically. So people learning there were really learning from the communities that that music is very much a part of. I learned a lot of music down there from this man named John Haywood, who's a friend of mine and was instrumental to my development as a banjo player. And he's a really amazing banjo player. He just put out an album called Upon My Word and Honor just a couple weeks ago. And it's a bunch of solo banjo tunes and stuff. And anyways, I learned a lot from John while I was there. And I also, I went up to visit this sort of master banjo player. His name is Lee Sexton. He was the nephew of this guy, Morgan Sexton, who was also sort of a giant in old time traditional music from Eastern Kentucky. Both of those guys are related to this other guy, Roscoe Halcom, who also kind of coined the term high lonesome sound. That's often attributed to bluegrass. That was first used to describe Roscoe's playing. So they're all kind of from that area. I'm just trying to connect the dots a little bit, maybe for people who yeah. would like that. So I visited Lee a few times while I was down there and Lee was in line for Kentucky and he's since passed away. I almost don't believe it now. I feel so lucky to have been able to meet him and spend time with him before he passed away. He's, you know, such an incredible banjo player. What were some things that you learned from him, Nora? A tune that I play a lot that I got from Lee is called Rye Whiskey. There's some singing, I guess, but I think about it as instrumental because it's floaty on the banjo and it's sparse. Lee played a lot in two finger style, which is, you know, if you think about your scrug style, it's got three fingers and you're doing this repeated roll. And there's something called old time two finger where it's just two fingers. You're picking out the melody with your thumb and creating some droning with your index finger. Lee kind of really helped me develop. I play a lot of two finger now, but spending time in Eastern Kentucky and especially with Lee, I learned a lot of songs in that style and that completely changed how I play the banjo and how I think about my own playing. I mean, spending time with Lee wasn't just about learning music, but also he was a really great storyteller and he would tell us some crazy stories in 
sometimes tell him a few times he was getting old, but I was very grateful to hear them again. Lee was, you know, he's a funny guy. He had a lot of jokes and lots of funny stories. It is pretty remarkable that you got to spend time with him. And I'm also curious how that relationship started, because it's not like you can just shoot these guys an email, or at least I wouldn't think so. Yeah, yeah. No. And I also would think that it might take him a minute to kind of warm up to this. Like, who is this kid from Brooklyn who is coming down to talk to me? Well, I mean, I think each time that I would visit Lee, I would always feel nervous that our places of origin would create some divide between us. I would always just feel nervous that I was somehow intruding on him and his music. And as soon as I was greeted at the door by him, that would all just fade away completely because Lee and his wife Opal were always so, so welcoming and so warm to people coming to visit. And lots of people would come through and visit Lee to hear his playing and, and learn from him. And so it was something that he was used to. You know, he was very generous with his music and sharing that. I'm also so grateful for how welcoming Lee and Opal were to me and my dad coming through. But yeah, how that kind of came about. You're right. You can't just send somebody like Lee an email. Sometimes I would call him, which was actually the best way to talk to him because he was very hard of hearing. And when the speaker was right up to his ear, I was the best. <laughs> I think how it first came about, I was at this festival called Cliff Top, and it's a fiddler's convention. There's a lot of jamming and some competitions and stuff. And I was competing in the banjo competition, playing this tune. It's actually Lee's version of this tune called Shady Grove. It's a classic tune. Ooh, wish I was a simon tree planted in the ground. Every time I do love that, shake a simon down. Shady pretty unique version of it. And the guy who is the MC for the banjo contest, his name is Sam Linkus, and he talked to me after and he was like, I'm a friend of Lee's and you should go meet Lee and hang out with him, play him that tune, play him that Shady Grove. That's kind of why I made that first trip down to Eastern Kentucky. I ended up going to that camp I was talking about, Cowan Creek, and it all kind of happens just through that community and going to those festivals like that and just meeting people. And it's a tight knit situation where people really want that connection and want people to feel welcomed. And I always am so grateful for how welcoming people were to me. Nora, I want to ask you about another guy named George Gibson. When was the first time y'all met and what can you tell me about him? I met George in that same span of a week that I was down there for the first time, I was at that camp called Cowan Creek. George taught a lot of music to John Haywood, who I mentioned earlier, and he's also a historian and has some work in that book I was talking about back before. John kind of helped connect me and George, and we went down to visit him, and I remember his response was like, okay, what do you want? He's very kind of um, closed off, but a um, really kind man, but he was like, all right. What do you want to do here? A little suspicious at first, right? He, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I was kind of like, I want to learn banjo from you. I had a couple songs that I knew that John had learned from him, and I'd seen John play before. Or, and I remember this tune called Shorten and Bread. Sure. Yeah, Shorten and Bread. That's a classic. But he has this kind of funky version that I wanted to learn. And anyways, we broke down a couple songs like that, and we'd also just sit there and talk. George, you know, is incredibly deeply knowledgeable about the history of the banjo in Eastern Kentucky. He did a lifetime of work recording and documenting the music of that region and protecting it for generations to come. Well, I want to talk about some of your music that you've recorded, I think, three records now. And I wanted to ask you about your first one, which was called Cinnamon Tree. What did that title mean to you? Where'd you come up with that name? That has a story to it. There's this song on the record that I was talking about before that I played at that competition. It's called Shady Grove. And it's a pretty common traditional song. I play Lee's version on that record. And there's a verse that goes, wish I was a simmon tree planted in the ground. Every time I true love pass, I'd shake a simmon down, something like that. That's kind of a traveling verse. It occurs in lots of different songs. But I sang it as 
I wish I was a cinnamon tree. I always thought about it as cinnamon. I guess that's because I just didn't have a lot of contact with simmons. Like a persimmon tree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So on the cover, there's a drawing of a persimmon tree, but then the name is cinnamon tree. The whole idea to name it that was Alice Gerard. She's a legendary old-time and bluegrass musician, and also she did a lot of work doing field recording and stuff. But she produced that album, and she was like, what if we call it cinnamon tree? Well, it's a great name. I love it. And there's some great music on there. I want to ask you about your most recent record, which is called Long Time to Be Gone. And I was looking at some of the song titles on there, and it's things like Jenny Put the Kettle On, Miner's Dream, Birdie Mae's Chili Winds, which I love, Southern Texas. And I'm wondering, how do you find these songs? I mean, is some of your process about kind of research and discovery, or are these songs that are pretty well known in old time music circles? Some of them include more research than others, and I get introduced to different songs through different interactions with different people and just being a part of this community I keep talking about. The tune, Birdie Mae's Chili Winds, just for example. I, I learned that off of a contemporary old time record, but the song's old. It's a guy named Brad Lefwich, who's a great old time musician, fiddler, and banjo player, and he actually did some work field recording Birdie Mae herself. So I learned it from that recording, but it goes back to Birdie Mae. And then there's other tunes. You mentioned Jenny Put the Kettle On, which is also another Virgil Anderson tune. But I think I really learned it from hanging out with another old time musician, Joseph DeCosimo. I think somehow we came about playing that in a jam, and that's kind of how I learned that. So lots of different contemporary musicians introduce me to songs that I pick up through that setting. But then there's other ones like Minor Stream is on there, which involved me learning that myself from a source recording. And sometimes there's many different interpretations that I am going through, or I'm, I'm being introduced to it by a contemporary musician who's done the research beforehand. So yeah, it varies. Of course, there's a lot of things on there that I learned from folks like John Haywood or Lee Sexton, where I'm learning them from person in a student to teacher kind of situation. Well, I love how these songs are passed around and traded and passed down and everyone kind of has a little bit different spin on them. And you're certainly putting your own spin on them. Yeah, I appreciate that. That's what it's all about. Well, I want to ask you about one more song that you recorded recently called Down in the Willow Garden. Talk to me about where that one came from and how it came together. That's kind of a classic song that's kind of very much in the the canon of traditional songs, but it's kind of a weird version. It just the chords are kind of weird. I played that for my grandpa, actually. My dad's dad lives in Nashville. He was like, eh, it doesn't sound quite right. It's very well known. And my grandpa, he plays a lot of bluegrass and old country stuff. And so he's not necessarily into old time music, but that kind of just shows the versatility of the song. Like it goes beyond traditional music. I learned the weird chord changes in that version of the song from my friend Jackson Lynch. We have a duo and we hang out a lot in trade tunes and he was playing that. He was like, maybe we should play this together. And we still do sometimes. Well, it's very kind of haunting and beautiful and you do a beautiful version of it. I don't know what the other ones sound like, but this one is just fantastic. <laughs> thanks. Thanks. Yeah. It was pretty cool to work with Sarah Kate Morgan on that. She's a dulcimer player that I met at Cowan Creek. She's a great singer, too. Great to have her work on that project with me. Well, down in the willow garden Where me and my love did meet Where we sat a cord And my love fell fast asleep So, Nora, you're going to be playing a lot of gigs, a lot of festivals this summer. What are some of the ones that you're most excited about? Well, I've never really been to the West Coast, so I'm doing a couple things over there with my buddy, Stephanie Coleman. She's a great old-time fiddle player. I really love playing with her, and we're going to be doing a lot of stuff together over the summer, actually. The first thing that's happening is we're going to Denmark, actually, for this festival called the Roskilde Festival, which is really not associated with 
old time music at all. In fact, Little Nas X is headlining the festival, so it's for pop music. But apparently they have some little stage that we're going to be playing on. I'm pretty excited about that, too. And yeah, we're doing a couple of things in the West Coast. There's this festival called Fiddle Tunes, which is similar to like a Cow and Creek kind of setting where there's lessons and it's about learning music. And I'm going to be a tutor there. So I'm excited about that. And then there's some stuff happening in Canada, too. That's going to be pretty cool. There's this island that there's this show called Alone. They film it on this island called Vancouver Island, and they have a festival there. So we're going to be there for that thing. So, yeah, it's a lot of traveling, which is going to be really, really fun. And That's great. Well, you got a lot ahead of you. You're about to graduate from high school, and you're headed to Yale University at some point. Congratulations. Yeah, thanks. What are some things that you want to explore musically in the next few years? I'm kind of excited for the new setting that I'll have in college. I know that there's a music community where I'm going and I'm excited to be introduced to some new things there. I've been listening to a lot of Irish traditional music recently and I have this idea in my mind of studying abroad over there to learn some music. And that kind of goes to the other side of my family. My great-grandparents immigrated here from Glen Colin Kill, which is a small town in Ireland. I don't really have a connection to music there through family stuff, but I've been listening to a lot of that, and I was working on a project where I was around a lot of Irish music, and I was pretty inspired by hanging out with those people. Do you see yourself writing more music in the future, or are you really just sort of focused on the more traditional songs? I feel like I've been kind of closed off to that idea for a long time, but I think I'm trying to be more open to it. It can be kind of a nerve-wracking thing, the idea of writing your own music, or at least for me, but... I wrote a little instrumental banjo tune the other week, and that was pretty fun. So I'm warming up to it. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'm sure there's a lot more of that to come and a lot more adventures in your future and probably some more trips to Kentucky, I'm guessing. Yeah, that would be great. I can't wait to get back there. It's been a while. Well, Nora Brown, thanks so much for being on Biscuits and Jam. It's been great to talk to you, Sid. Thanks for listening to my conversation with Nora Brown. Southern Living is based in Birmingham, Alabama. Be sure to follow Biscuits and Jam on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And we'd love your feedback. If you could rate this podcast and leave us a review, we'd really appreciate it. You can also find us online at southernliving.com slash biscuits and jam. Our theme song is by Sean Watkins of Nickel Creek. I hope you'll join us next week for my conversation with Ed and Ryan Mitchell the father-son team behind a new cookbook and some of the best barbecue in North Carolina. We'll see you then.